The reading is taken from Matthew 3, uh, 1 to 12. In those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who is spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the river Jordan. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not think you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe has been laid to the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn, and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Thanks so much, Gina. And let me add my welcome to you. Uh, if you're visiting or a friend um, of Moses or family of Moses, it's really good to have you here. Um, we are in the book of Malachi at the moment, uh, but before we turn there to have that reading, something I've enjoyed personally uh, reading through Malachi has been this um, play on words of the word messenger. So um, the, word, the name Malachi in Hebrew means my messenger. That's what it means. So Hebrew words, um, Hebrew names rather, have meanings. My name is Benjamin, that's a Hebrew name, and it means uh, son of the right hand. That's what it means. So if you hear Benjamin, you should really think Jesus, because he's the son of the right hand. Uh, not because, because you see me, but because you see Jesus. Um, he's the son of the right hand. Malachi is a Hebrew name, and it means uh, my messenger. Now the play on words is, in chapter 3, verse 1, uh, there's this famous quote in the New Testament of this, of this verse, which is this, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. My messenger. And in the text it says, I will, I will send Malachi. Uh, but it's not the capital M, meaning the person Malachi, it's just saying my messenger. So here's the play on words. Malachi, who writes this Old Testament book, who's a prophet of the Lord, the messenger from God, prophesies about a future Malachi, John the Baptist, who is also going to be uh, speaking to, to the Lord's people. And they have very similar messages. So we've just read, haven't we, in, in Matthew, that John the Baptist is calling everyone to repentance and faith. But he's especially hard on the teachers and those who rule and look over the people. He calls them, you brood of vipers. You know, you're supposed to treat your teachers with respect, aren't you? Now how about that, for respect? But he's particularly hard because God knows those people have more responsibility since they're teaching the people. And so it's going to be something very similar. The, the theme of Malachi is the theme of John the Baptist. They're calling everyone to repent, whether you're a teacher or not. But in particular, if you're a, if you're a teacher, if you are a leader or someone with authority over God's people. So as someone who works for the church, this has been something that the Lord has held over me to get my heart right under, um, but it does speak to all of us, particularly as we saw last week, uh, all Christians are priests, there is the priesthood of all believers, and so this, is, this text that we're going to read is relevant to all of us, as we shall see, so there you go, plain words, let's have a look at Malachi, so if you have um, a Bible, please turn to Malachi, it's the last book of the Old Testament, uh, so if you're at Matthew, just go back a few pages, and you'll be in Malachi, so we're going to read Malachi chapter 2, verses 1 to 9. And a little bit of orientation, if you're just joining us now for this, Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament. Uh, it's written sort of 80 to 100 years after the return of the exiles to uh, the Promised Land, and they've rebuilt the temple, 
And it has been a very exciting time for God's people. They've come back out of exile into the promised land. They've rebuilt the temple, which was a, a promise. All of these promises are coming true. And the next big promises are that God's Messiah will come. And he will usher in the new kingdom where he will rule forever. And it's going to be great for Israel. So it's an exciting time. But, as we heard, the years have trundled on. This happened 80 years ago. The temple was rebuilt. And he's still not here yet. And so Israel... Their temperature cools down, and they have ended up just going through the motions. And so that's where we get to, and God has some very, very strong words now, particularly to the priests. So have a look down at Malachi chapter 2, verse 1 to 9, and let's just ask for the Lord's help one more time before we read this. Father, we, we are about to read some incredibly strong words from you. Please uh, help us not to shield our hearts or faces from them, but would we hear them, please? so that we would see the Lord Jesus Christ and his great salvation for us who believe. We pray this in his name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so have a look down at Malachi chapter 2, verse 1. And now, you priests, this warning is for you. If you do not listen, and if you do not resolve to honour my name, says the Lord Almighty, I will send a curse on you, and I will curse your blessings. Yes, I have already cursed them, because you have not resolved to honour me. Because of you, I will rebuke your descendants. I will smear on your faces the dung from your festival sacrifices, and you will be carried off with it. And you will know that I have sent you this warning, so that my covenant with Levi may continue, says the Lord Almighty. My covenant was with him, a covenant of life and peace. I gave them to him. This called for reverence, and he revered me and stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth, and nothing false was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness and turned many from sin. For the lips of a priest ought to preserve knowledge, because he is the messenger of the Lord Almighty, and people seek instruction from his mouth. But you have turned from the way. And by your teaching have caused many to stumble. You have violated the covenant with Levi, says the Lord Almighty. So I have caused you to be despised and humiliated before all the people, because you have not followed my ways, but have shown partiality in matters of the law. I wonder if you've ever had your mind changed after receiving a strong warning about something. Maybe you're about to eat a slice of pizza and someone says, oh no, don't eat that. It fell on the floor. And not just that, but the dog then licked it and ate it and then spat it out again. You don't want to eat that. So you don't want to eat the pizza anymore. Um, following the recent riots that happened across the country, the government and the police issued pretty strong warnings about what would happen if you, if you got caught up in the protests. And then that managed to sort of squash them a little bit, didn't it? People heeded the warning. And um, I've told you before, I, I have a Crohn's disease, a stomach condition. I lived with it for a long time without uh, doing anything about it. And I put up resistance to medication when it was finally diagnosed. Uh, a doctor said to me, you're going to have to have go on some medication. And I, I sort of sat down and I spoke to them. And I said, well, look, I've been dealing with just paracetamol for a long time. Um, I don't really want medication. It's quite invasive. I think I'm okay. Thank you very much. And they very patiently listened to, to me spout this nonsense. And then they told me how it was. They said, if you don't take this medication... You're in serious danger of your small bowel perforating, and you will conduct uh, sepsis, and you could die. I was like, when do we start? <laughs> okay, so warnings. The first uh, point this afternoon is this. See the patience of God in warnings. Because that's what's going on here. Have a look down at, at verse 1. God says, he's, this is the Lord speaking, he says, And now, you priests, this warning is for you. This warning is for you. And so, as I said, we are going to hear some strong, to be honest, unpalatable stuff here. But what I want us to be amazed at as we leave this place this afternoon is not that God is saying these things, and some of us may be amazed that God says these things, and that's okay. That's good, actually. We should be shocked. But the thing that's more amazing is that God is not doing them yet. That's what's more amazing. This is just a warning. 
And so sort of warning shots from the Lord. He's actually restraining himself, holding himself back. He has every right to just fully do everything he's about to warn them, but he's not. He's holding back and he's warning them in love. And that's amazing. And I want us to see that as we go on. So let's have a think about this warning that God is giving. What have the priests done to receive this warning? What have they actually done to receive this warning? Well, last week we heard how they've been offering sort of dodgy sacrifices to God. This week we've read that they're being destructive with their teaching. That's the, that's the issue. They're being destructive with their teaching. Have a look at verse 7. For the lips of a priest ought to preserve knowledge because he is the messenger of the Lord Almighty and people seek instruction from his mouth. And so the, the Lord says, this is... This is what you ought to be like, priest. You ought to preserve knowledge. In other words, truth should be on your lips. You should be speaking rightly. First of all, because you're speaking for the Lord Almighty. You're not just saying your own things, priests. You're oracles of the Lord. When you speak, it's me you're representing. And not only that, but when pe people seek instruction, where do they go? They go to the priests. So if people want to hear about the Lord, if people want to know what the Lord's will is, they go to the priests. Now Moses, we've just baptised him, but he's not born with a complete understanding of who God is, is he? And so he needs teachers to teach him who the, who the Lord is, what the Lord's done for him, what he needs to do in response to the Lord. And so it's essential that the mouthpieces of God, the teachers, the priests, us, it's essential, isn't it, that we speak rightly about God. And this is why God made a covenant with the tribe of Levi, who were the priests. God made a special covenant with them. Have a look at verse 5. My covenant was with him. This is Levi. He represents the, the priesthood. A covenant of life and peace. I gave them to him. This called for reverence, and he revered me and stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth. Nothing false was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness and turned many from sin. Wow. That's a grade A sort of report card, isn't it? That's a priest doing his job properly. He's revering God, he's walking with him, he's got true instruction on his lips. And the result of that, doing that well, God says, is life and peace. And actually, turning many from sin, which was the priest's job. And also, not just Israel. This is what is exciting. The plan for Israel was always... The priest would turn Israel from sin so they would follow the Lord. And then as Israel followed the Lord, they would, they would get the whole world to turn from sin and to follow the Lord. The priests were priests to Israel, but Israel was meant to be a priest to the whole world. And when it's right, it works. That's what God wants to give. So here's the reason for God's warning. Here's the reason for God's complaint. Have a look at verse 8. To the priests of Malachi there, he says this, But you have turned from the way, and by your teaching have caused many to stumble. It's bad enough, priests, that you yourselves are not following me as you ought to. But worst of all, is actually by your teaching, the very thing that's meant to turn people from sin, you are turning people to sin. You're causing many people to stumble. They can't get to the finish line of life and peace and being turned from sin. They're stumbling because of the teaching of the priests. So do you see how serious this is? <coughs> What's on the line here? Life, peace, being turned from sin. People are stumbling because of the teaching of the priests. Okay. So how did they cause people to stumble? What is it actually that they're doing? Have a look at verse 9. God says, you have shown partiality in matters of the law. This seems to be the big reason why they're making people stumble through their teaching. It's actually not that they've completely left the faith and the religion. It's not like they've just totally ignored it and become secular. It's not that. They still look, for all intents and purposes, very religious, these leaders, these priests. They still are doing some of the uh, things, and so from the outside they look okay. Jesus said of the Pharisees, who were the religious, religious elite of his day, he said of them that they loved to be seen praying on the street corners. That's quite a religious thing to do, isn't it? 
go to Haywards Heath High Street, find the corner so that not only one road can see, but another road, and then pray as loudly as you can. That was pretty impressive. Isn't that religious? Jesus said that they loved to wear long flowing robes. That was the religious garb of the day. Wow, that's pretty religious. Jesus actually said their phylacteries were wide. Now, a phylactery is a little wooden box that a uh, sort of priest would wear on his head. It was strapped to his head, a wooden box with a little lid on it. And if you peered inside the lid, there were little scrolls. And it was the Torah, or passages from the Old Testament. And the priests wanted so much for the word of God to be in their head and in their minds and on their thoughts that they actually physically started to wear little scrolls on their foreheads. And Jesus said, their phylacteries are wide. Can you imagine? It's like coming into school the next day. You've got the biggest box on their head. Come on, I can fit all of Genesis in mine. Or can you fit in yours? Excellent. Blah. Genesis there. Their phylacteries are wide, and yet Jesus is very damning, isn't he? About the Pharisees. He says that they totally desecrated other laws, and in fact they devour widows' houses. So, imagine someone is just posting Bible verses on Snapchat constantly, 24-7. But then actually they never go to church. And they swear their head off all the time. That's a little bit like what's going on here. Look very religious, but are, have, are partial, have shown partiality in matters of the law. It's sad, actually, we see this very thing happening in major historical denominations around this world today. People are presenting very religiously on one hand, but are leaving other laws completely derelict in their place. And we see the Lord's warning uh, for people who do that. This is why, by the way, why we preach here in this church through verse foot by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book. It's because then we preach the whole counsel of God and we don't, we don't be partial in what we teach. To be honest, today's passage, not a very nice one. It'd be easier not to preach it. But we want to be impartial with the word of God. We want to present it as it is. And so that's why we do it here. So that's the reason for their warning. They're causing many people to stumble because they're being partial. They're following some laws, but not others. Now, what actually is the warning? What is the warning? What is God warning them will happen? We'll have a look at verse 2. He says, if you do not listen, if, this is still a warning, if you, still, if you do not listen, and if you do not resolve to honour my name, says the Lord Almighty, I will send a curse on you, and I will curse your blessings. Now, what is that curse? Have a look at verse 3. Because of you, I will rebuke your descendants, and I will smear on your faces the dung from your festival sacrifices, and you will be carried off with it. If you think that's horrendous, you're absolutely right. You've, you're picturing it rightly. That's horrible. Having dung smeared on your face by God. That's, that's horrendous, isn't it? But actually, it's even worse than it sounds. And I want you to stick with me through this section. Because the, the deeper you see the horror of this, the brighter you see the Lord Jesus Christ. So stick with me. When an animal was sacrificed by the priests, they would present um, some of it as a burnt offering to the Lord. Normally the fat, that was the best bit, the sort of the, the cherished bit, the expensive bit. So they would get all the fat and some of the internal organs and they would burn that on the altar. But the dishonourable parts, like the, the, the skin and the intestines and the dung, they would all be taken out, outside of the camp, outside of the city, and they would be burned. So imagine like a sort of ancient dump. You know, you take everything to the dump, it's on the outskirts of town, so you can't smell it, you can't see it, but you take all your rubbish there. That's where this sort of stuff goes. It's a way of demonstrating that to be in the camp is pure because God is there. Only pure things should be in the camp because that's where God is. And so if you have anything unclean, it needs to be taken outside and burned and got rid of. It doesn't belong to God. Actually, even the person who would take the bits outside had to go and wash themselves before they could come back into the camp because they touched the dung in the intestines and so they were considered unclean. And so this whole ritual, the burning the good stuff, getting rid of the bad stuff, all of that is about illustrating God is pure. 
You can only have pureness with God. The rubbish and the impurities and the dishonor, it all has to go outside and it has to be burnt. That's what's going on. And so why is this curse that God is warning so shocking to the priests? It's because the priests were the ones who operated at the very center of the camp, of the city, in the temple where God dwelled. They were meant to be the ones who were closest to God, actually. They were chosen by God, set apart from the rest of Israel, to be the ones who would be in the temple with him. And God is saying to them, you will be carried off outside the camp, away from the presence of God, smeared in the dung of your unacceptable offerings, to be burned on a rubbish heap, because that is what you are. Impure. Unclean. Yeah. Detestable. Worst of all, God is speaking to them here actually of eternal judgment outside of heaven. Jesus uses this expression of being taken outside of the camp into the outer darkness quite a lot, and he uses it to describe hell. It's shocking what God says to these priests. I hope you're shocked, because it's shocking. But consider for one moment with me, will you? Consider for one moment with me the greater shock of the priests smearing dung in the face of God. God is their loving father. That's how he describes himself in chapter one. And they've smeared dung in the face of their father. God is their master. They have smeared dung in the face of their master. How? By offering diseased animals on his altar and causing many to stumble. You see, the altar, uh, sort of plumes of smoke would go up, and it was, it, it was described as a pleasing aroma to the Lord. So anthropomorphically, it's a picture of God having sort of sweet-smelling smoke in his face. But if you put a diseased animal or an impure animal on that, what smoke's going to go up into the face of God? Dung. In the face of God. The priests are smearing dung in the face of God through their unacceptable offerings through their, the way that they don't want to give God the best, and it's like smearing dung in the face of God. Not only that, but they've smeared God's name through the mud. You know when someone smears your name through the mud and they say false things about you, wicked, awful things about you? That's what these priests have been doing about God. They are messengers of God, and they've been smearing God through the mud. And so look, God is only going to do to them what they have done to him. It's the dung of their sacrifices, did you notice? The dung of your sacrifices that you have smeared in my face, I will smear in yours. The priests were effectively carrying God out of the camp in the way they treated him and putting him on the rubbish heap. That's how they were treating the altar. It's like a rubbish heap. They have no right to carry God out of his own camp, but God has every right to carry them outside of the camp. So the curse that God is, is warning the priests about is shocking. I'm going to smear dung in your face and carry you outside the camp and you're going to be burnt. But it's more shocking, isn't it? Isn't it more shocking that these priests who were meant to be the ones who represented God were smearing dung in his face? Whenever we, you and I, ignore God in our lives or we treat him contemptuously or we're partial with his laws, we're very good at that one, we do some things he says, but not others. Whenever we do things like that, are we not also carrying God out of the camp of our hearts so that we can be God and rule, and God is on the outside, on the rubbish heap, and we're God in his place? I've done that in my life. But as I said at the beginning, the amazing thing here is not that God says these things. That is amazing. The amazing thing here is that God is not doing them. He's restraining himself. He's holding himself back. He has every right to do this right now. You have profaned the name of the Lord your God. You, the very ones who are meant to represent me, not only to Israel, but to the whole world, you have profaned me. I'm not going to judge you just yet. I'm going to warn you in love so that you can repent and turn. And so my second point, I've only got two points this afternoon. My second point is this. We have to listen to our true priest, Jesus. Normally, warnings come with um, alternative instructions, don't they? If you're following a Google Maps 
uh, you're driving somewhere, maybe you drove here today, and you're following Google Maps, if there's like an obstruction in the road or there's some traffic, a little warning pops up, doesn't it? It says, if you keep going that way, you will get stuck in traffic. But then normally it says, here's an alternative route, that means you can avoid it. Or if you click on a spam link accidentally, uh, your sort of computer antivirus or your phone, uh, something might pop up and say, whoa, you don't want to go there, you want to go here instead. Get me out of here. Normally warnings come with alternative instructions, and that's what the law just does here as well. In verse 2, we see that the way to respond to this warning is to listen and revere God's name. And so who do we need to listen to? Who is it that we have to listen to? When he says, if you do not listen, who are we listening to? Well, in verse 6 here, we have a truly wonderful description of Jesus, don't we? A foreshadow of Jesus. It's talking about Levi, but this is really, I think, ultimately about Jesus. <coughs> have a look at verse 6. True instruction was in his mouth. Nothing false was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness and turned many from sin. I see Jesus when I read that. I don't know about you. Because Jesus Christ came into this world to save sinners. Jesus Christ came into this world to turn people from sin who have been partial in the way that they live, like me. Those people who have chosen some of his laws to live by and ignored others, he came into the world to save them. He's come into this world to save people who have broken the covenant with God and so have the crosshairs of God's curse on their foreheads. Those are the people Jesus came to save. And the way he did it, I'm going to be very excited now for the rest of the sermon. The way he did it was to willingly bear the curse of God that we see here on himself. God warns that this curse is coming. Jesus saves us from it. How? By bearing it on himself. And that's how we're freed from it. So what was that curse? Well, it was being rebuked by God. It was being smeared in the face. And it was being thrown outside of the camp of God. Let me explain that to you very quickly. See, on the cross, Jesus Christ was smeared with all of our sin, was he not? All of our half-hearted offerings to him, the way that we come up to church on a Sunday and we honour him with our lips, but then we're swearing at our partner on, on the Monday, or cheating our work colleagues on the Tuesday, or looking at something we shouldn't be looking at on the Wednesday. We have smeared uh, Jesus with our sin on the cross. He took it. He was smeared with all of that. And Jesus was literally carried outside of the camp. You know where Jesus was crucified? It was outside of Jerusalem. And so pictorially, we have this image of here he is being taken outside, like the, like the dung, like the intestines, like the dishonorable, impure things. <coughs> Jesus was taken outside of the camp, and he was crucified on Golgotha, which is outside of J Jerusalem. He's on the outside. And there he faces the fiery burning of all that's impure under the wrath of God. Isn't that amazing? We've broken the covenant. There was a curse coming from us. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13 says... Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Verse 3 here in Malachi chapter 2, ultimately I think he's talking about the cross. Jesus is a descendant of Israel. He's rebuked 400 years later so that we aren't. Jesus is carried outside and smeared with dung figuratively on the cross in shame so that we aren't. Jesus carries our impurities and is thrown on the rubbish heap so that we aren't. Verse 9 here. Malachi, uh, the Lord says uh, through Malachi to the priest, So I have caused you to be despised and humiliated before all the people. And that's what happens to Jesus. Isaiah 53 is an extraordinary prophecy about Jesus, written hundreds of years before he was alive. Just listen to this. With verse 9 of Malachi chapter 2 ringing in your ears, I have caused you to be despised and humiliated before all the people. Isaiah 53 says this, he was despised, Jesus this is talking about, and rejected by mankind. A man of suffering, familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised. And we held him in low esteem. You see, God is warning you and I. These are the curses that are coming because of sin. But these curses were paid for by Jesus. It goes on, Isaiah 53. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions. 
He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. Something amazing struck me this week. Even though God is the one who was smeared by dung through us and our sin, Jesus comes into this world to be smeared all over again on the cross. We've smeared God and so there's a curse coming. God himself steps into this world in the person of Jesus Christ and takes the smearing, the curse, all over again. He takes both offences on himself rather than it land on us. Why does he do that? Because he loves us. John 3.16, for God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, shall not be carried out of this world, shall not have to face the fiery wrath of God burning up in purity on the outside but have eternal life. And so who do we need to listen to? When Malachi says, if you do not listen, who do we need to listen to? We need to listen to the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. Life with God forever. Jesus says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Peace with God forever. Have a look at chapter 2, verse 5, Malachi. My covenant was with him, a covenant of life and peace, and I gave them to him. Life and peace were given to Jesus, and Jesus gives life and peace to those who listen to him and who believe him and believe in him. Listen to just three verses from John chapter 5. This is Jesus saying, this is what we need to listen to. So if you're only listening to one thing, listen to this. This is Jesus. For just as the Father raised the dead and gives them life, even so the Son gives life to whom he is pleased to give. My sheep listen to my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my words and believes in him who has sent me has eternal life and will not be judged but has crossed over from death to life. True instruction is in the mouth of Jesus. Nothing false is on his lips. So, can I speak to you if you are not a Christian here today? Can I speak to you and implore you? Will you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? Will you believe in this one who went outside of the camp and was smeared with your sin? And took the fiery wrath of God to burn up all the impurity of your sin. Will you believe in him so that you can come into the camp cleansed where there's life, where there's peace? Because that's the only way. There's no good works we can bring. There's no phylacteries you can wear on your head. And you can say, God, look at how, much, how many laws I follow. Nobody follows every law. And what's the result of that? There's a curse coming. Jesus came into this world to take that curse so you don't have to. If you believe in him. If you have faith. So if you're not a Christian, please, are you hearing this? And you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you are a Christian, then look, because you have listened and because you have believed, Jesus says you have crossed over from death to life. This isn't a future thing that's going to happen. You have crossed over. All of your sin was burned away. And now you have life and peace with God. And so look, if you're a Christian and you have believed this, and you know in your heart you are being partial with some laws, you know in your heart there is not everything you're doing is quite right, then can I ask you, why go on being partial? It's partiality that God is particularly angry about being hypocritical. You can ask a member of SALT what the word hypocrite means and they'll tell you. Not because they're hypocrites, well they are, but that's okay. We're all hypocrites, SALT. They just know what it means. We're all hypocrites. Let's consider these areas of our lives where we know we're not quite living as we ought to. Let's bring these things back to Christ, our Saviour, let's listen to him. <coughs> By his word, as his spirit helps us to understand it, let's listen to him, the Lord Jesus, through his word, and let's recommit ourselves to him, to go on with him, with his help. 
We're going to um, finish by singing an old 18th century hymn called Rock of Ages. The band want to come up um, and get ready for that. It was written by a minister called Augustus Top Lady. What a name. He's a top guy, Top Lady. Augustus Top Lady in the 18th century. The, the verse that was preached when he was converted is Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13, and it's this. It says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Isn't that just a wonderful picture? You who are far away on the outside, you've been brought near in by the blood of Christ. And that speaks of what we just heard. And the third verse of this song reads this. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling. Naked, come to thee for dress. Helpless, look to thee for grace. Foul, impure on the outside, in the darkness. Foul, dung, intestines, rejected. Foul, I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, or I die. That's the cry of the Christian. Wash me. Save me. So, if you've never sung that before or said that before, there's no better time than now. God is warning us before this comes. And so heed the warning. Sing it now uh, together. Let me just pray. And then we'll <coughs> Father, we thank you so much that actually you don't sugarcoat what is coming to us uh, because of our sin. But you tell us very, very starkly. But Father, when we see the starkness of what we've done to you and what is coming because of sin, we see the beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ all the more. That he was willing to step into this world and be smeared all over again with our sin. He was willing to be taken outside of the camp and burned by your wrath so that we don't have to. So that we might have life, so that we might have peace. Father, thank you for how wonderful you are. Jesus, thank you for that sacrifice. Spirit, thank you for revealing these things to us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.